Welcome to worship this morning at Shaman Baptist. We have a delightful worship service planned for us today. Uh, we want to remember uh, this morning LaGrange College, where uh, it hasn't been at least 15 minutes ago, hasn't been broadcast, but two students were killed last night in a traffic accident, uh, two baseball players. My understanding is they just won the championship for something. I guess they were celebrating, but uh, a lot and a lot. The, the college is just really going through a whole lot right now. And uh, let's pray for these families and uh, ask that the Lord bless them, be with them. If you have prayer requests, I know of your own. Uh, there's a prayer list that's here in the Family Life Center in the back. Pick you up one if you would. We'll see you back tonight at six thirty in this place. For worship and praise. Tony is uh, still with us. <laughs> she is uh, feverish and didn't sleep and woke up not feeling really good. But uh, you know what? Okay, so she's on her way to a recovery. Amen. Let's keep praying that uh, for her. And uh, let's pray for the Holy Spirit to move in our hearts this morning as we give him worship, as we go to the Word of God to uh, look at uh, this week and next one of the most one of the oddest passages that there is in all of the Bible. Uh, we're going to jump into it and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to understand it. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you this morning that we can come with the Bible um, in our hands, uh, with the Spirit before us to guide and to lead us into all truth. I pray this morning for families uh, of these two young men. These lives were lost last night. We ask for your comfort and peace. May it be theirs. We lift up those who are uh, grieving over loved ones in uh, our church uh, this morning. We, we want to give you the Richard Finley family, and then we also give you the Grant May family. Carol, and work, and just the exhausting work she must do alone and settling matters for grant. We pray that you would grant her strength and peace. Uh, we pray for those who are sick this morning. We lift up uh, a friend of this church, Carolyn Watt. We ask that you would grant her grace as she recovers from uh, cardiovascular problems. And, uh, be with her in Birmingham, Lord. Touch and heal her. Be with Tony. Uh, we pray uh, to get her through this and back to us uh, soon. Lord, we love you. We, that's why we're here today, is to tell you that. We've come for no other reason, none but you. Now, may that be our prayer and our heart. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, Ken, we made it, Ken. Did you come on 85? 
I did. Did you get stuck? Nope. Ooh, I did. It, it took me an hour to get here today. But I'm glad I'm here, and Ken's going to lead us in worship. Ken? Well, good morning, and if you'll turn to uh, hymn number 213. And in the book of Psalms, it says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud the rock, to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is great. He is a great God, the King of all gods. And this morning we'll just bring our sacrifice of praise to him this morning.
chapter 28. Let's dig deep into the Word of God. Over the next two Sundays, we're going to, um, we're ultimately, hopefully, going to come away with being uh, better interpreters of the Bible we're going to uh, learn this week and next two really uh, important principles of reading the Bible. That uh, if we if we lose sight of these two concepts, what happens is uh, it'll just be a mess as you're trying to work your way through, especially the Old Testament. So let me tell you what we're going to be doing for the next two Sundays. So it's this morning, then we're going to come back tonight, and then next Sunday morning and next Sunday night. Uh, by the way, all, all four of those services will be here at the Family Life Center. What we're going to do this morning 
uh, and this evening uh, is we're going to be looking at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 28. And there, there are several things we're going to be doing. The most important is, is to hear the word of God uh, to us. What is 28? What is it saying to us? How is it applied in our lives? How can the word of God become practical to us? So uh, we're going to be going in that direction, hopefully. By the way, next Sunday will be part two of this uh, sermon today. So it's actually three sermons on 1 Samuel 28. Uh, this Sunday morning, next Sunday morning, we'll be looking at the chapter practically. Tonight, we're going to come back and look at it more technically. Uh, because as you're about to find out, as we're reading through this passage this morning, all kinds of questions are going to come to your mind. And so the best way to deal with that is essentially by doing a Bible study. So tonight we're going to come back and bring your Bibles and we're going to bore down deep into this chapter to take a look at it. Next Sunday night, what we'll do, then we're going to go back and pick up 27. So uh, 27 in itself has all kinds of uh, questions that come up. And so next Sunday night, we want to read that passage. We want to look at it more carefully. And so we're going to give a couple of Sundays then, uh, that, which is about what we do anyway. We, when we're going through 1 Samuel, we are, have essentially been dedicating almost one Sunday per chapter. Uh, so if you want to know how long we've been studying 1 Samuel, we're in the 28th chapter right now. That gives you some idea that uh, at least for a half a year, it's actually been more than that with COVID coming and going. 1 Samuel 28, story of Saul and the witch of Endor. Uh, 1 Samuel 28, beginning in verse 3. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. The Philistines assembled and came up and set up camp at Shemiah, while Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or by Europe or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium so I may go and inquire of her. There is one in Endor, they said. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and at night he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. But the woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. And the woman asked, whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. What does he look like? He asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. And Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I am in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me. And 
God has departed from me. He no longer answers me either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, why do you consult me? Now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy, the Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David, because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both you, Israel, and you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Immediately, Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing all that day and all that night. When the woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly shaken, she said, Look, your servant has obeyed you. I took my life in my hands and did what you told me to do. Now please listen to your servant and let me give you some food so you may eat and have the strength to go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his men joined the woman in urging him, and he listened to them. He got up from the ground and sat on the couch. The woman had a fat calf at the house, which she butchered at once. She took some flour, kneaded it, and baked it, baked bread without yeast, then set it before Saul and his men, and they ate. That same night, they got up and they left. Our Father God, we thank you this morning for this word. We ask now uh, that it would be life to us. Uh, we pray that we will be good Bereans. As in the book of Acts, those who carefully and uh, with by your help by the Spirit's power, we need your help in interpreting and living and applying this word to us today. Thank you this morning for these that have gathered here in the Family Life Center. Uh, bless our morning together as the word, I pray. May it bless us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Four words describing Saul as we find him in 1 Samuel 28. This is an introduction. Just four words that can summarize him. Number one, desperate. First thing that we learn about Saul's position in this passage is that he is absolutely desperate. Why is that? Well, we see it in verse four. The Philistines assemble and came and set up camp at Shenem while Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. And when Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid and terror filled his heart. What's going on here? Okay, let's switch lines. I didn't think that thing was working very well. Let's try those. <laughs> All right. Is that better? Yeah. We'll see. All right. This is a desperate situation that he's in. Why is that? Well, several reasons. First of all, let's not forget who the Philistines are. So everything that we know about the Philistines up in this passage of Scripture in 28, 
these guys are absolutely, they are the fiercest warriors in Canaan. Uh, one of the most uh, formidable foes of Israel at this time, it's the, it's the Philistines. I think I've told you about archeological excavations and Philistine tells little mounds and uh, archeological sites in Israel where we dig up artifacts where we find uh, things from Philistia at the time. And one of the most common artifacts that you'll always find among the Philistines, you know what it is, do y'all remember? Beer mugs, <laughs> the fierce fighters, Fierce drinkers. Uh, these Philistines, you need to think twice before you jump into a battle with them. Well, we also know that they are people that have perfected the use of iron and they are the first to use chariots. And here we've got, so, oh, by the way, we, we would have had to have read 27. So I'm just going to tell you something that happened in 27 that's really, really significant here. David, and you'll have to come back next Sunday night to figure out why, but David has gone over and joined with the Philistines. That's weird, but that's the fact. This is Saul's enemy. The Philistines are Saul's enemy. What, is the, what do they say? Your enemy's enemies, my friend. Saul looks at the Philistine situation here in 20, and it says when he sort of reconnoitered and looked around and saw what was going on, it said literally that his heart just dropped down out of his chest. It was a fearful, fearful situation. He's desperate. Number two, dark. This is arguably one of the darkest moments in all of the Bible. And in fact, there are many who believe that 1 Samuel chapter 28, if you're going to find Saul hidden bottom, this is it. Because what we discover here is that Saul, and we'll see this tonight, he is deliberately violating one of the most serious prohibitions that we find uh, in the first uh, five books of the Old Testament, Leviticus 20 and 6. I, the Lord said, will set my face against anyone who turns to mediums and spiritists to prostitute themselves by following them. I will cut them off from my people. This is the king of all people of Israel, disguising himself, going out by night. He asks of the spirit. He first asks of God. He said, can you help me with this situation with the Philistines? And so Saul, he, he's struck by the silence of God to his request. And so then he turns to his servants and he says, listen, if I can't get an answer from heaven, I guess what we'll just do here, let's see if we can get an answer from hell. So he reaches out and he finds a woman and he's, uh, she's a medium that he may inquire of her. And so he's essentially saying, if I can't hear from God, I'll go hear from someone else. I'll just go over to the dark side, desperate, dark, number three, diminish. So now we're in the 28th chapter, we're dealing with the life of Saul and what we discover in 28 is how here Saul is half of what he was ever destined to be when we first meet him in chapter nine of First Samuel. Because one of the interesting things about uh, chapter nine is that there we discovered that Saul as a young man, he was anointed to be king and that incredible word spoken to Saul. There is not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders, he was taller than anyone in Israel. Oh, the potential. 
he had, but now look at him at 28. I mean, you can barely recognize Saul here. What we see here is a man who, in fact, is slip sliding away, fading away. He's dying day by day, week by week, month by month, and he's doing it from the inside out. No spear. Remember how the spear was always associated with Saul? <laughs> Every time David would go to minister to him, right? You remember those stories we covered? He'd hurl the spear in. David would have to go run in. You, a man with a spear, but he has no spear here. Why? Because it's already been captured in the encounter in an earlier incident before we get to 20. No robe. The final divesting, as it were, of his kingly identity. Where did it go? Well, we read about it in the last few times we were together in 1 Kings. Remember in the cave? David, David thought that he was not going to touch the Lord's, Lord's anointed. And, and remember what he does? He goes, cuts off part of the robe. No robe anymore. It's in tatters, desperate, dark, diminished. And the final word that we discover that would so summarize the life of Saul, as we find him in chapter 28, is the word dead. Now I'm going to get a little ahead of myself here. I'm going to let you in if you haven't read ahead yet. But what we discover is, is that in less than 24 hours of this incident, Saul and his family will be dead, desperate, diminished, dark, dead. Well, there's Saul, chapter 28. Let's look at this passage. What does 1 Samuel 28 have to say to you and me? Well, there's several things that we want to look at. What we're going to look at this Sunday morning are characteristics of those choose to live by any means other than God. What are some things that we find about people who choose to live that way? That's what Saul's doing here. Next week we'll come back. Where this morning we'll look at the characteristics of such people. Next week we'll look at the outcomes of people who choose to live by any means other than by God. Well, this morning, let's talk about this. Characteristics of those who choose to live by any means other than God. Three things we want to look at. Number one, the first thing that we discover in this life of Saul here is that, oddly enough, such people may possess what I call a smidgen of devotion. I like that word because that kind of describes Saul. As bad and as dark as he is here in 28, there still comes out something that we've seen in his life in our study. There's still this little smidgen of devotion that he's got for the Lord. Let me read to you a very interesting passage of scripture. It's one, I have two reasons for reading it to you. One, it's going to make this point. But the other is, is that I want to make sure if you ever get to 1 Chronicles that you don't think that there's a contradiction in the Bible between 1 Chronicles chapter 10 and 1 Samuel chapter 28. I want you to listen what 1 Chronicles 10, 13, and 14 has to say about this incident in 1 Samuel 28. Listen. The chronicler said this, so Saul died for his breach of faith he broke faith with the Lord and that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. And then it says this, listen. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. All right, let's stop here for a moment. What? 
First Chronicles says that he didn't seek guidance from the Lord. Well, we just read in First Chronicles chapter 28 that he did. What's going on here? Well, I think what we are dealing with here is that the sum of it is, is that he did seek guidance from the Lord, but only faintly. And he probably, his heart was far from it. He sought it, if you like, but you know what? He already had a backup plan. He sought guidance from the Lord, but he sought it too little, and he sought it too late. There's a principle that emerges in this passage of Scripture. And the principle, I would word it like this. It's good to keep a journal of your passion for God and to seek God with urgency when your heart begins to grow cold to Him. I think it's a good thing to keep a journal on paper or in your mind or in your heart as you look back to your life and your devotion and your passion for God. And I think it's a good thing to seek God with urgency when you begin to detect, you know what? I'm just not what I used to be as a Christian. You know, it's interesting, Matthew 24 and 12 and Revelation 3, 11 and 22, I think it almost reference 1 Samuel 28. Matthew 24, 20, 12 says this, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. Revelation 3, 11 and 12 describes the church of Laodicea and it gives to them this very serious indictment. I wish Christian that you would be either hot or cold, but don't sit on the fence. He says, because if you're lukewarm, that's where you are spiritually. He said, judgment's gonna come to the believer. In his book, Francis Chan, Crazy Love, he gives a profile of the lukewarm Christian. And I just want to read the little bullet points that Francis Chan mentions here. Luke, uh, he says, lukewarm Christians don't really want to be saved from their sin. They just say it. They won't only be saved from the penalty of their sin. Number two, lukewarm Christians are moved by stories about people who do radical things for Christ, yet they do not do radical things themselves and have no interest in doing so. A lukewarm Christian, number three. Lukewarm Christians equate their partially sanitized lives with holiness. But he goes on to say, but Jesus didn't call us to sanitation. He called us to discipleship, number four. Lukewarm Christians rarely share their faith with their neighbors, co-workers, or friends. Or like Spurgeon said, you're either a missionary or you're an imposter. Number five, lukewarm Christians think about life on earth much more often than they ever think about eternity in heaven. Number six. Lukewarm Christians love their luxuries and rarely give to the poor, to the needy, and to the dispossessed. Number seven, lukewarm Christians do not live by faith. Their lives are structured, so they never have to. He quotes David Platt, if you're not in a place where you feel desperate for the Spirit of God, then there's no way you're on the front lines of the mission. When we are on the front lines, we feel desperate. We need the Lord. And then finally, lukewarm Christians give God their leftovers. 
was not their first and never their best. And then he says, stop calling your complacency and apathy, quote, a busy schedule or forgetfulness. Chan says, call it what it is, Malachi 1 and 8. It's evil and it's wrong for mammon to be your God. No, characteristics, before we get too hard, I guess, on Saul and 28, one of the characteristics of people who choose to live by any means other than God is that, you know, they may have a little bit of devotion in their life, just like Saul did. Number two, the second thing that we see about uh, people who choose to live by any means other than God is that they may possess fading memories of commitments past. We see this in verse seven. Did you notice in our reading that when Saul asks his, okay, let's stop here for a moment. We learn in this passage that at some time in the past, Saul must have issued an edict for the ridding of spiritists and mediums throughout the land, right? Okay. But when he goes and he asks his servant, God's been silent. So he turns to his servants and he says, hey, do any of you guys happen to know where we can find a good spiritist? Every one of his servants immediately, they raise their, oh, I know where one's at. Yeah, man, sure. I know exactly where one is. Well, that's weird. I thought he had gotten rid of all the spiritists in the land. I thought he didn't want any spiritists in the land. Well, you know, presumably what we find in this passage here is that Canaanite practices were apparently once eliminated <laughs> But now what we discover, once again, they are fully integrated and they're embedded back again into the life of the people. I mean, it would have been a far healthier situation if he would have asked of his servants, can someone go find me a spiritist? And for all of them just to look back at him, sort of confused, scratching their heads and say, we don't have an idea anywhere. Where are you going to find one at? says that they responded immediately. You know, Revelation 2 and 5 has an interesting passage that, that asks this of the Christian. Just look back on your life. Do you remember a time Remember, the revelator says, the heights from which you have fallen. And it brings us then to a, a, a principle on the second point, which I would word like this. When all the victories of your Christian journey are found in a dusty old yearbook, dated 20 years or more or later. Maybe an urgent time for you to seriously and like need a lesson with tears to ask of God, God, I need to rededicate my life to you. I remember what it was. But Lord, I have slipped. Characteristics of those who live by any means other than God, and that leads, leads us into our final thing that we learn about Saul and about us and the danger that can come to our life. The third thing that we learn 
is that people like this may even possess a very impressive form of religion. I mean, they may look really good, but two things I want us to see here. I want you to note in this passage that when Saul speaks to the medium at first, and he, she at this point doesn't know who he is. She, he's just asking her, I need you to call someone up. I want you to know that her first reaction to him was, ain't hey, no way. What? Haven't you heard? Is ain't going? The king, the anointed of Israel, asking of, of the medium to call someone up from the dead, and it is the pagan who looks back to the king of Israel and says, there ain't no way I'm going to do this. And then he looks back to her, and here's the point I'm trying to make. He looks back to her and he says, look, if you'll do this for me, he says, I want you to know that everything is going to be all right. Because he says, as the Lord, as God, Yahweh, as the Lord lives, he looks back to her and he says, it's going to be okay. Now, isn't that an odd thing for someone to say? You know, he has no basis by which he can make that kind of pronouncement to her, including the Lord, you know, in on his lies. He has no basis to make that promise to her that everything will be. Where's he getting that from? You know, it's interesting that in the Jewish writings, there's a whole literature from, from the first century where the rabbis commented on the Old Testament. It's like this gigantic commentary called the Midrash. When the, when the rabbis back then commented on 1 Samuel 28, one in this passage, they capture kind of the oddity of Saul saying something so contradictory in this way. They said, quote, who did Saul resemble? At this moment when he said this, they said he resembles a woman who is with her lover and swears by the life of her husband. Now, how do you do that? There's a second thing I want us to notice in this passage. Did you note the weird way that 28 ends with this business about the meal? Did you kind of wonder what's going on here? You know, the medium brings up, you know, Saul comes up, I mean, Samuel comes up, Saul hears from him, he collapses, he's laying on the floor, and the medium now comes over and she's shaking Saul and says, you know, I think you need a little bit, I think you need something to eat here, right? Well, what is Paul's, Saul's response to her when he said, when she says to him, I think you need to eat? What did he say to her? First thing. He said, Sandra, give her the prize. No. Uh-uh. I eat. No food for me. Why? Why would he refuse? I mean, he's collapsed on the floor. He's absolutely wasted and exhausted. Everybody, the men included, plus the medium, they're looking at him and said, you know what you need to do? You just need a good meal. That'll get you back into it. No way would I ever touch the stuff, says Saul. Why? 
Well, there's probably, we've already encountered this before in our study of Saul. Do you remember that Saul had this weird practice? We don't know why he practiced it, but we have already encountered once, and I think we're encountering it here a second time, where Saul actually believed that it was a devoted thing to God for he and his troops to fast before a battle. It got him into trouble before. Remember that? You remember that? Yeah, it got him into trouble before. And here we are again. He's facing the Philistines and the guy and his troops aren't eating. And for some crazy reason, Saul has totally made up this crazy religious fasting thingy that somehow before God's army will go out to fight that everybody needs to fast for 24 hours. That's stupid. <laughs> That's not what you do when the Alabama football team or Auburn war eagles are about to take the field. You don't find the coach saying to them, Boys, I think what we need to do, let's not eat for about 48 hours before the Iron Bowl. You think? What's going on? Why is he doing this? Well, you know, the Old Testament does not ever accuse Saul of being irreligious. Ever. It does accuse him of being reckless in his application of religion to his life. And so what we discover about Saul from beginning to end is that he repeatedly he turns to the right, then he turns to the left in his faith. Sometimes he's adding supplemental regulations to those that have already been imposed by the Torah, in other words, requiring soldiers to fast for battles. Sometimes he's ignoring Torah altogether. Here we have a passage in 28 where he thinks he's doing the religious thing when in fact it's killing them. And so often that is in fact what happens to you and me. We're in the practice of our religion. Not only is it killing us, but it doesn't impress the Lord at all. You know, one of the, one of the most fascinating passages in the Old Testament is Isaiah chapter 1. Because in Isaiah chapter 1, the Lord, looking down at Israel, Israel in Isaiah's day, sinful, disobedient, oppressing the poor, stealing from those who have not, not helping some, anybody that's in need. He looks down to them. And I'm telling you, these are the most religious people that you can find. I mean, they're going to the temple. Sunday morning, Sunday night, they're at discipleship, Wednesday night, Wednesday morning, they're going to revival every time the doors are open, in and out of the temple, in and out of the temple. And you know how he felt about it? You know what he thought about their religion? Nobody could ever say it better than Isaiah, the greatest of all the prophets. He writes in verse 11, Isaiah 1. He says to them, he looks down and says, why this frenzy of sacrifice? God's asking, don't you think I've had my fill of burnt offerings, rams and plump grain-fed calves? Don't you think I've had my fill when you come before me? Whoever gave you the idea of acting like this, running here and there, doing this and that, all this sheer commotion in the place providing for worship. Why do you people do that? 
Quit your worship charades. I can't stand your trivial religious games. Monthly conferences, weekly Sabbaths, special meetings, 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 meetings. I can't stand one more, says the Lord. Meetings for this, meetings for that. I hate them. You have worn me out. I'm sick of your religion, 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 while you go right on sinning. When you put on your next prayer performance, I, says the Lord, will be looking the other way. Wow. You got a show? You rehearsed for it? You got it down? Have you had all your practices? Are you ready to go? Is it show time? Lights, camera, action. And the Lord says that when your prayer performance begins, he says, this is what I'm going I'm walking out. I don't even want to look at it anymore. Wow! And so what we discover is a principle I think that we should ever be aware of. And the principle of this third principle this morning is this. When you find yourself on Sundays investing more time in deciding what you will wear that day, rather, to what you will become that day. You know, it may be time for a revival in your life. When the only thing that gets you excited anymore is about religious duty, and religious practice. And when that puts kind of a leap in your step more, and stepping out, and coming to a place of devotion and relationship with God, and as Isaiah points out to us, that's followed up by getting up from that place of devotion and leaving this place and going out into a world that's full of all kinds of needs where people need help and they need love. These are the people that I'm looking for, not religious folk. Well, the characteristics of those who choose to live by any means other than God, one, they may possess a smidgen of devotion. Two, they may possess fading memories of commitments past. And then finally, number three, they may even possess a very impressive form of religion at all the time where it's just like so. No different. Before we ever, ever cast stones at anybody in or out of Scripture, Peter says this. Here's a good principle. Let judgment always begin in the house of God. It begins right here. Father, this morning we thank you for this lesson in 28. It is sobering. It is hard. It's a hard pill. But Lord, the medicine that you offer is the medicine of life. And it calls us to humility and it calls us to recommitment. Father, don't let us slip slide 
into passion less, devoted less Christianity. May this church always be one of heart and not of frenzied activity. It's all about you. This moment that we have, Lord, right now in this place, it is a call from the word of God for us to rededicate, to recommit, to pray for the revival fire to fall upon us, for us to bow our knee before God, for us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. I pray this morning that this be the prayer of us all, and that as Ken takes this moment to lead us in a time of reflection and rededication, may it be so for all of us. I thank you for this congregation. I thank you that we are here this morning and this family loves you. And we've come here, Lord, for only one reason. What brings us here today is you. Now work within my heart, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Ken's going to lead us now in a time of rededication. I pray that you will use this time to do so. Ken. Would you turn to number 504? 504. someone who walks with us through the most difficult of times and will be with us through all eternity. I want to thank you for that, God. I want to thank you this morning for heaven and Richard Finley and Novus and that reunion that happened last week. I thank you for Grant and his life. I thank you for Carol and the family. Our Father, we pray today that our study in Samuel would be a study in ourselves. Point the spotlight of your spirit on our hearts to see God that we may see where we can't go and be in you. We want to be everything that you prophesied in chapter 9. We want to live up to the potential that you have for us, God. Don't let us slip. Don't let us slide away. Thank you for the hope that there is in you. Now dismiss us this morning, I pray, until we meet again. I pray that you will bless richly this congregation with your love and your presence. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you back tonight. I hope you'll come. We're going to look at the
1 Samuel 28 and try and answer some of these tough questions that arise. Okay, come back tonight with your Bibles. We will see you then. God bless you. Love you. Bye bye now.